Hi, everybody. This is Barbara Gottlieb, Director for Environment and Health at Physicians for Social Responsibility, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, The Health Risks of Nuclear Power. We'll be getting started in just a minute. I'd like to give uh, more folks time to jump on and join us. But in the meantime, let me go over some of our housekeeping items. Um, we're accompanied on this webinar today by Julia Morgan, PSR's web magician. Uh, thanks to Julia, this event will be recorded. That means that you and others who are on the call, as well as everybody who registered, um, will be able to access the webinar. We'll send you an email later this week with a link um, that, will, uh, that will connect you with the uh, webinar recording. For those of you who are on the webinar with us today, you, you are muted. You will remain muted during the presentation. But we are reserving a good chunk of time for question and answer after our speaker's, speaker's presentations. You'll be able to raise your hand to ask a question using the little hand icon in the control panel in the corner of your screen. Or if you like, you can submit questions using the chat box. So feel free to type them in as we go along. And Julia will read them out again at the end of the presentation. Our presentation today comes in response to a request from PSR chapters that are working to promote clean, renewable energy in cities and states around the country. A number of them have encountered a somewhat startling proposal that nuclear power be included along with solar energy, wind, geothermal, as a clean or a carbon-free energy source. The thought is that nuclear power doesn't produce heavy greenhouse gas emissions, so if you want to prevent catastrophic climate change, it's a reasonable option. As strongly as PSR feels that climate change is a terrible threat to human health and survival, we don't agree. Whether you're looking at the health issues that arise when you compare nuclear power to clean renewables, or if you're looking at the survival issues when you consider the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, PSR firmly opposes nuclear power. So we decided to share some information that would better equip our chapters to respond to the arguments that come up. Uh, we'll have two presenters today, and both of them have prepared lists of source material that they used in preparing their slides. So they or we will make those lists available. We'll send them out to you with that same email that I mentioned containing the link to the webinar recording. Um, by the way, uh, as, the, um, as the, the first slide indicates, uh, yesterday, well, as the first slide reminds us, yes, yesterday was the 39th anniversary of the accident and the huge radioactive leak at Three Mile Island Nuclear Plant in central Pennsylvania. That was the nation's worst commercial nuclear accident, and it was caused by both technical malfunctions and human error. We'll hear more from our speakers about the threats to health from this type of accident, as well as from the rest of the nuclear supply chain, from uranium mining to nuclear waste. Uh, next slide, please. We have, um, as I mentioned, two speakers today, and I'd like to introduce them. Damon Moth's story has been advocating for clean renewable energy and nuclear abolition for 16 years. Working with Oregon PSR and Washington PSR, he works to build regional momentum for a just transition from fossil fuels and nuclear power to a renewable energy economy. Mary Olson is with the Nuclear Information and Resource Service and implements their mission in the Southeast. She joined the NIRS staff in 1991 and is a frequent guest on radio and has appeared on national and regional television. I'm also proud to be able to claim her as a member of the PSR chapter in Western North Carolina. Mary has a BA from Reed College with a double major in biology and the history of science and subsequent study in chemistry and biochemistry at Purdue University. Uh, Damon will be our first speaker, so without further ado, Julia, let's move to Damon's first slide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, my name again, my name is Damon Montstory. I work for Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility and Washington State Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, and I'm very pleased to be a part of today's presentation on why uh, nuclear power um, is not clean, not safe, and not renewable, and certainly shouldn't be fitting into the piece uh, of the climate uh, carbon reduction uh, puzzle. So um, I actually can't see the slides, so I'm assuming we're on the what is nuclear power slide. Is that right? Help me out. I can't see them either. And you uh, cannot. 
hoping our attendees oh. will be able to see them. Um, there they there are. They go. Yep. Wonderful. Thank Can Thank we back you. up just a quick second? I would like to have people see that slide from uh, from Three Mile Island. There are our two speakers, and if we bet, there we go. This is a uh, Three Mile Island personnel cleaning up radioactive contamination, just to, to keep it real. Thanks much. If we can now skip back ahead. Thank you. So I just want to start by um, doing a very quick overview for those who may not know or may not be very familiar um, with what we're talking about when we talk about nuclear power. Um, so, you know, we, there are sort of two main ways that uh, uranium ore can be used um, to turn into fissile material for the process of nuclear fission, which then uh, can either go into nuclear weapons production or nuclear power. Um, and uh, the basic process is a chain of nuclear uh, fission. And so basically you fire a neutron at a uranium-235 isotope um, and it breaks that, that, uh, that atom apart into a number of other fissile products. Um, and that uh, creates these uh, highly radioactive particles that are very unstable, that are continually uh, emitting radiation. Um, and the process also creates a tremendous amount of heat. And the basic process, the way we turn that in elect into electricity um, is that the heat produced from this chain reaction of breaking apart uranium molecules, um, sorry, not molecules, atoms, uh, is creates a tremendous amount of heat that then boils water. And so, um, as many have said, this is a very expensive and very uh, um, uh, my, very tiny way to um, uh, boil water. And that's that's really what what nuclear power is. And then the actual effect to health and the human body comes from ionizing radiation um, from the uh, the byproducts, the waste of this this process, um, and that inflicts. Um, damage on the cellular level, which can cause uh, various cancers, mutations, and cell death. Um, and now I should mention that it is, it is a challenging situation um, to try to directly track and trace um, cancer results from uh, exposures to radioactive materials because often the latency period between exposure to uh, certain dosages of radiation um, can be very long. It can be a number of decades before a cancer manifests uh, itself after an exposure to radiation, depending on the dosage. But of course, we, we may recall um, that uh, in, in very concentrated doses of radiation exposure at high levels can be um, instantly and very quickly fatal. Um, so depending on the dose size, the health effects vary. Next slide, please. So at the very beginning of the fuel chain for nuclear uh, power and nuclear weapons um, is uranium mining. And uh, it has a long legacy of contamination and disease in the United States, primarily in the Southwestern United States in New Mexico, Arizona on Nav the Navajo Nation land, um, but also in indigenous land uh, across the world. Um, and uh, just for some context here, it takes about 200 tons of uranium ore annually to power a conventional, that 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant. Um, and there have been a lot of different examples of uh, demonstrated contamination of air and water in uh, regions near uranium mines. And a very notable um, example of contamination comes in the very same year, in fact, three months after the uh, Three Mile Island nuclear uh, incident in Pennsylvania, in the same year, 1979, in Church Rock, New Mexico, a uranium mill spilled over 1,000 tons of solid radioactive mill waste and 93 million gallons of acidic radioactive tailing solution. That made the Puerco River uh, unusable for a long time, and many local Navajo uh, residents were not informed about the health risks of this contamination and continued to use the river uh, for irrigation of crops and, uh, and other purposes. And so um, we see this again and again, there's been a real historical lack of good communication um, to nearby residents of uranium mines about uh, the health impacts of uh, uranium mining and its, and its impact on people's uh, livelihoods. Next slide, please. And so that's just the beginning end of the, uh, nu the nuclear fuel chain. And what we then see is that it then goes into uh, processing, enrichment, uh, and then goes into reactors or into nuclear weapons production. Um, so on the, the map on the left-hand side of this slide here is as of May 2017, 
the operating commercial nuclear power reactors in the United States. Um, and I want to focus in on the one in eastern Washington state there, um, the Columbia Generating Station. And uh, this is the Northwest's only commercial nuclear plant, and it is uh, continuing to be under heightened Nuclear Regulatory Commission scrutiny um, and has performed consistently in the bottom quartile of all reactors in the country. Um, we've only learned about that bottom quartile performance because of anonymous whistleblowers who have bravely come forward to the media um, in, uh, in secrecy to talk about uh, poor safety culture at the, at the plant itself. Um, and uh, in a related incident in uh, 2017, 31 workers at the Hanford site, um, which is the site where they uh, manufactured the plutonium for the Nagas bomb dropped on Nagasaki in the 1940s. Um, 31 workers who were uh, deconstructing the plutonium finishing plant pictured in the lower right of this slide uh, ingested plutonium and tested positive for internal plutonium contamination. Uh, which lodges itself in bone marrow and uh, is directly linked to um, very high risk of uh, bone cancer, leukemia, and other cancers. And so this sort of um, process has been happening at, uh, your, at, at, at highly contaminated radioactive sites um, across the country and across the world. And uh, we see a common thread that workers at uh, commercial nuclear power plants and at uh, weapons sites like this um, fear retaliation if they speak publicly about their health and safety concerns. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary, um, who will now talk a little bit about regulations, um, but first a little bit about um, some of the global contaminations from uh, radioactive accidents at re -power commercial power plants. Thank you, Damon, and thank you everyone who's here today and listening. We appreciate the chance to share with you. Um, indeed, yesterday was the 39th anniversary of the major reactor accident in the United States, Three Mile Island. These two maps show radioactive contamination from two other reactor accidents since. The one on the left is a map of Europe. You can see Italy down at the bottom. Scandinavia at the top, and it is cesium-137 being uh, mapped by contamination. Now, indeed, we are about one half-life through this contamination because it's about 30 years, but there's still 19 more to go in terms of the hazardous period, and some of this contamination, indeed 40% of Europe, is well above what would be considered a normal level of radiation, and there's certainly lots of children and people who've grown up in the last 39 years in these areas. Chernobyl was in, well, is in Ukraine and was part of the Soviet Union in 1986 when the reactor exploded, burned for 10 days, and deposited all of this contamination from a single reactor unit. On the right-hand side is a much more local map of Fukushima Prefecture. In 2011, most people are well aware that a earthquake and tsunami triggered multiple meltdowns and explosions at the Fukushima Daiichi reactor, which is in the center of those two circles plotted. This map was made by crowdsource. People attached radiation detectors that were all calibrated the same to their cars, drove in the area, took airborne readings, and um, uploaded them to Google Earth. Um, again, this is a map from early after the accident, but as you can see, there's a lot of contamination quite a distance from the reactor, well outside of the areas where people were evacuated. Um, I want to just say that people are suffering a lot of effects besides cancer from both of these events. And yet our radiation regulations only evaluate cancer as the outcome. So the next part of my talk is going to focus on cancer, but I want to acknowledge that it is not the only radiation health effect. Next slide. So radiation regulations, how good are they? The US Nuclear Regulatory Commission licenses civilian nuclear activities and industries and applies regulations to protect the public. These regulations are in the federal code under Title 10, Part 20, and they're available online. You can look them up at the government printing office, GPO. The question is, is protection adequate? Given the potential scope of exposure from nuclear power, this is an important question. Next slide. 
So I'm going to look at two fundamentals. I'm tagging them as problematic because they're the focus of what I'm going to be talking about. The first is the use of reference man. Um, all of the radiation regulations in the United States and indeed worldwide assume reference man, and this sets both the biological sex and the age of the individual used by regulators in any calculation or scenario having to do with ionizing radiation. There's a few exceptions, but generally that is the case. And the second fundamental is that rules are applied on an annual basis, giving the licensee a full year to report their um, own monitoring, self-reporting, and to average across that year. Next slide. This is a screenshot from Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. I'm just going to give you the high points of the reference man's definition. It is from the International Commission on Radiological Protection, which means that it is used worldwide. And basically, using the cheat sheet below, we know this is a guy 20 to 30 years old, 154 pounds, 5 feet 7 inches, lives in a moderate climate, and is specified as a Caucasian and Western European or North American in habit and custom. Next slide. So we're going to look at one case. Um, and I want to be clear, this is a case of childhood leukemia near operating reactors in Germany. German radiation regulations are similar to US. <clears throat> and like the USA, there are cancer clusters observed particularly in children near nuclear power reactors. I chose this case because there's a large peer-reviewed literature. It spans the last 15 years on the question of these leukemia clusters in Germany. And they've documented that the rate of leukemia is highest in children who live near reactors. There is a direct correlation between the proximity of the home to the reactor, the distance from the reactor to the occurrence of leukemia. And the literature also soundly excludes many other non-nuclear factors as causal agents. Nonetheless, there has been a strong denial of harm by both the nuclear industry and the regulators until, next slide, we got an information leak. And as Damon says, these are often anonymous. But this was an information leak about a routine radioactive leak. And the leak went to, the information leak went to IPPNW, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, um, a closely allied organization. And this leak came from the most southern reactor. I'm not going to try the name, but um, it's a specific site. And it was the actual inspector, we believe, who leaked the information. Next slide. Dr. Alfred Korblein plotted the data that he received from this anonymous source, and this was during a refueling of the reactor, very important point, in 2011. And the data was of airborne radioactivity. And the first couple days, you can see the red line is very low along the bottom. And then on the 20th of September, there's a sudden spike that lasts for about five days and then tails off over the next um, 10 days. This spike corresponded to when the reactor vessel was opened. And the data shows radioactive gases that were not contained and actually formed a plume that left the site, most likely, since um, airborne stuff that's not contained will leave the site. Next slide. Now, the actual link to why this might be the bad actor for leukemia was made by Dr. Ian Fairley with additional analysis because he figured out that there would be water vapor in that release. And radioactive hydrogen, called tritium, can be incorporated actually into the water molecule that can cross the placental barrier during pregnancy. The embryo has hematopoietic tissue, and in early term, that tissue is very concentrated. It's not yet differentiated. Dr. Fairley posits that beta radiation from tritium harming embryonic and early fetal tissue may subsequently result in deficient production of blood cells, leukemia, in the child after birth. Next slide. So taking this case, and believe me, I am very well aware of cancer clusters in the United States. This is not unique. 
and in order to operate a reactor, you have to refuel it. So the opening of the vessel is actually an intermittent but routine activity at every reactor in the world. So taking this case, the regulatory assumptions are not protective. An adult male cannot represent an embryo or early term fetus. It's not only their relative mass, but the cells are not comparable. Much lower exposures may cause harm since the tissue is not yet differentiated. It's very concentrated, so a single hit may cause more harm. Duration of exposure that may cause harm is shorter. Tiny but potentially damaging exposures cannot be sufficiently monitored. And catastrophic damage to an embryo or fetus may result in spontaneous loss of the pregnancy. Such loss or any other cancer, non-cancer impact is not considered in radiation regulation. And then the second point is that allowing a full year to show compliance with the standards hides intermittent spikes in radioactive release levels. And there may be others besides the opening of the reactor vessel. We don't know and the public is not notified. Next slide. Okay, now I want to return to the reference man for a moment because there's also the factor of biological sex. It assumes that everyone is a male. And it turns out that biological gender is a factor in radiation harm. Next slide. This next portion is um, based on this report. The US National Academy of Science published the biological effects of ionizing radiation, also called BEER-7. It's a series of reports, report number seven, phase two in 2006. About 100,000 people of all ages and both genders survived the first nuclear weapons that the United States chose to use on cities full of people. Next slide. As we've already shown in our case, children's bodies are small, so the same amount of radiation delivers a larger dose. Since children are growing, we know their cells are dividing more rapidly. The DNA in those cells are more likely to be damaged if exposed to radiation, leading to more cancer. Next slide. In the NAS report, they are uh, using the lifespan data from the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These people were grouped by the age they were at the time of the bombing in 1945. The groups were tracked over their lifetimes, cancers and cancer deaths were counted. There are problems with this data, but we can broadly say that those who were five years old or younger in August of 1945, when they were exposed, had the most cancer at some point in their lives. The surprise in this data is that girls in this group were twice as likely to get cancer at some point in their lives than were boys. For every male in the birth to five year cohort that suffered, suffered cancer across their lifespan, two, year, two female people got cancer. That is a doubling, which in biological research is a very big flag. I did my analysis of this data in 2011. Dr. Arjun Makajani published the same findings in 2006. I'm using the image of two boys and four girls to indicate that this is a ratio. Next slide. Gender was also a factor for those who were adults at the time of the bombings. Over their lifetime, women exposed suffered 50% more cancer death than did men in the same age group. For every two men in these cohorts who died of cancer, three women died of cancer. Next slide. This is the same information in graphic form. The age of exposure is at the bottom. Numbers of cancers across 60 years are reported in the age cohorts. The pink line is girls, the blue line is boys. We can easily see the gender difference across the entire graph, and yet also that it is greatest in young children. The entire graph is a snapshot of our species' cancer response to external radiation exposure. Next slide. It's extremely important, however, to understand that little girls are not a subpopulation. We are an inextricable part of the human life cycle. Next slide. So this just takes and focuses on the fact that those who are most impacted are not reference men, which is where the 
age correspondence would be on the blue line in the 28 year old approximate range. So it, those who were exposed as young girls, the young girls in Hiroshima and Nagasaki suffered 10 times more cancers across the same 60 years as those who were exposed as adults. And this is adjusted for lifespan. Next slide. And I like to give this a, a real point because when a cancer in a population is attributed by regulators to radiation on the left, and if that exposed population includes young girls, which certainly are maps of Japan and Europe and radiation contamination, there's lots of young girls, then over time, as many as 10 cancers will occur, but not be attributed to radiation by exposure officials. This means a pretty big underreporting. Next slide. And the answer to the question about whether the radiation regulations are good enough, I believe is no, they're not good enough. This question of why is radiation a risk factor for cancer is a question that no one has even asked or answered by regulators or researchers to date that I'm aware of. So I always challenge younger people listening to take this as one of their goals in life to consider a, a career that will ask and answer why is gender a risk factor for more cancer. My mentor, Dr. Rosalie Bertel, suggested that maybe it has to do with high risk tissue. Female bodies have more than male bodies, but we don't know. It's a hypothesis. And next slide. This is a map of where over 2,000 nuclear weapons have been set off to date. It's not the fallout patterns, it's the ground zeros. And the map was constructed by uh, the artist Isao Hashimoto and is a very big um, warning to all of us to take these questions seriously. Damon? Thank you, Mary. Can we move to the next slide? So it's very appropriate, appropriate that Mary ended off her one of her segment of this uh, presentation by talking about nuclear weapons explosions because uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility is probably most famous for advocacy on uh, alerting the public to what is one of the largest public health risks in the history of humanity, which is nuclear war. Um, and uh, folks in places like the Marshall Islands and in the southwestern United States know that uh, beyond Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we've had nuclear weapons testing that has had significant health impacts on people. And there's a real connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Um, and I love this quote from uh, Robert Sokolow and Alexander Glaser in a paper they wrote in 2009, that a nuclear weapons free world would be more stable and more secure without nuclear energy. And they are not actually anti-nuclear advocates or anything like that, but they, they recognize that this, uh, this fuel chain here is used for both weapons productions and nuclear reactors. Um, and we have you know, evidence that, uh, that the P Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, for example, focused on the plutonium route. You can either go the route of plutonium or highly enriched uranium uh, to develop nuclear weapons. And they focused on the plutonium route uh, to, use, to employ nuclear weapons development using material from the safeguarded Karachi nuclear power plant. Um, and so we've seen, we've seen this, this pattern already play out. Um, and uh, most of the majority of the nuclear weapons states in the world um, also have a, uh, an active commercial nuclear power program going on in their countries. Um, and so that Pakistan is, is not alone in having both nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And uh, a few, we, we also are, would do well to remember that the uranium mining uh, supply of this chain uh, is the same for both nuclear reactors and for uh, weapons productions. Um, so there is a real direct uh, connection here and, uh, and there is a real threat of proliferation um, from expanded use of nuclear power. Um, particularly expanding it to new countries, um, as has been proposed um, by many by many groups. And I want to just uh, mention also, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the risks of nuclear as a not clean and not safe energy resource, but it's also not a renewable energy resource and uh, doesn't fit in a plan to address climate change. And I do want to address that uh, this, this diagram of uranium mining to enrichment, weapons productions, reactors, reprocessing, 
um, you'll notice the big truck uh, on the diagram for uranium mining. And that's a good reminder uh, that the, the life cycle of nuclear power does have a carbon footprint because there are a lot of fossil fuel uh, machineries that have to go into the process of mining and transporting um, the uranium that uh, that is used. This is this is an extractive economy uh, energy source, and it uh, it does have a carbon footprint, even if it doesn't uh, emit uh, greenhouse gas pollution at the point of electricity generation. Next slide, please. Transitioning more into this question of climate change, it's also important to look at the economics of nuclear power. Um, over time, nuclear has become less and less economical when compared to other power generation sources, particularly as wind and solar have become far cheaper, um, even in the, the short time frame of 2009 to 2017. So this graph that you're looking at here um, is uh, the levelized Lazard levelized cost of energy values from the year 2009 to 2017. And this is an average cost per megawatt hour of generating electricity from different sources. Nuclear in purple, coal in gray, gas combined cycle that's sometimes called natural gas is fracked gas and methane gas um, is in green uh, and utility scale solar and wind power are in the sort of uh, grayish blue and the deeper blue color there. So you'll notice that uh, over this time frame, so utility scale solar has fallen from $359 average uh, per megawatt hour to $50 per megawatt hour on average, um, just a little bit above wind power at $45 per megawatt hour. And uh, that is, you know, a full third of uh, the cost that nuclear has seen, which is a big increase from uh, where it has been historically. Um, and I just posed the simple question of uh, which which modular power resource would you would you buy um, a, an average of $150 for nuclear power or an average to 45 to 50 for wind and solar. Um, I will also mention that um, there really is no evidence that any new so called small modular nuclear reactors that are being proposed and have not yet been uh, successfully built or implemented anywhere in the world. There's no evidence that such small modular nuclear reactors would be able to beat um, this particular cost uh, competitiveness. Um, there's there's claims that sort of factory producing uh, nuclear reactors would would uh, make them cheaper, but uh, in fact that actually then causes them to suffer from a lack of economies of scale. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what is renewable energy? Well, uh, one, one site that I was reading says that it's ener an energy resource that is replaced rapidly by a natural process and, and gave some examples of uh, wind power, solar power, wave power, and geothermal. Um, and uh, so nuclear really does not fall under this category because it does rely on an extractive process, uh, much in the same way that we have to mine for coal and frack for gas. Um, we have to mine for uranium in order to fuel the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, so it does not qualify as a renewable energy source. Um, and an additional, in addition, in terms of uh, considering the impacts on people, fossil fuels emit air pollution and greenhouse gases that lead to climate change. And nuclear power creates a radi radioactive pollution. And as I said, its life cycle still has a significant carbon footprint. And reprocessing of nuclear fuel is highly polluting and um, is also not renewable. And Mary, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words about nuclear fuel reprocessing and some of the issues there. In brief, the traditional uh, way to reprocess is to pull out plutonium and any other uh, element that could be used as a fuel for bombs or reactors. And the first step is to chop up and dissolve the fuel rods, which are a ceramic solid, and dissolve them in acid. And the one place where this was done in the United States for civilian purposes was West Valley, New York, with a $10 billion cleanup tag today because of the number of accidents, spills, fires, and the amount of so-called low-level waste produced in that process, still highly, highly radioactive. There are some new uh, proposed, um, but as yet undemonstrated, reprocessing technologies, and many of those have proliferation problems. But the word I always put on this whole thing is smear, because it takes radioactivity that's contained and smears it all over 
facilities and makes it much more mobile to be released into the environment. Europeans have done this by discharging it into the ocean, which I think we can all figure is a bad idea. Thank you, Mary. I agree. Uh, can we see the next slide? So in conclusion, um, we are not going to be able to satisfactorily address absolutely every single piece of nuclear power and why it's not clean, safe, or renewable. All we've been able to do today is give a very brief uh, summary of some of the issues around regulations, around uh, carbon reduction goals, and why nuclear power um, is, is not a responsible energy solution due to a number of these factors. And we could spend an entire webinar just talking about you know, the exact health implications of radiation exposure and the ways that that happens because of proximity to nuclear reactors and nuclear waste dump sites. And we could spend so much time talking about any one of these individual issues. But the, the bottom line is um, that uh, I, I am reminded of health provider medical ethics of do no harm and veracity with patients. And basically, to sum up, you know, our energy solutions um, should not uh, do harm. Uh, we should mitigate the harm that any energy solutions we come up with do to our, our, our people. And so, you know, something that, that fuels um, global climate change and, or has risks to nuclear weapons proliferation and, and nuclear waste generation um, are, are very harmful practices. And in addition, as Mary lifted up, we really need more information and more public notification about what is going on in the nuclear industry. There's, there's a lot of outlying questions and a lack of transparency um, in uh, a lot of case studies that we're already seeing. In addition, we need to know what exactly is the cause of the gender split on impacts of radiation. And we need uh, better research and better understandings of some of the science and health impacts of, of these uh, radiation exposures. Um, and so we are calling for expanded research and better public access to information from regulatory and industry bodies. Um, and based on the understood risks of global climate change and radiation, and I, I'll add proliferation as well, um, we call for renewable energy and for countries to cease the use of nuclear power because uh, in, in science and medical fields, um, you don't charge ahead with a treatment um, or a practice before knowing that, uh, that you have enough si significant um, protection for human health. Um, so based on that, on that principle, we know that, uh, that we need to move forward with, uh, with feasible renewable energy instead. Uh, that wraps it up for me. Mary, do you have any final, final conclusions? Um, open for questions. Um, let's just move to the next slide, please. Um, I, I'd like, just before we go into the question period, just to bring us back to our starting point, to remember that um, we looked at this issue because we're really um, all working together and very hard to increase and to hasten uh, our society's transition to safe, clean, renewable energy. Uh, Damon already talked about some of the criteria for uh, what is renew what is clean renewable energy. Uh, we have our own list here. I would just point out that um, nuclear power um, only only meets one of these criteria. And so for a score of one out of one, two, three, four, five, six, one out of six, that's what about 16%, I think nuclear power clearly fails. And where, um, let me again mention that um, from the perspective of physicians for social responsibility, um, when, you're, when you're facing health threats uh, that you cannot cure, the only response is prevention. Let's move to the next slide, please. So we'll be opening up the floor now for questions. If you'd like to um, ask a question, raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon on your control panel. Um, and Julia will unmute you when it's your turn. So Julia, can you um, unmute a person and we'll hear our first question. Barbara Laxon, do you have a question? No. No, my only question was about the uh, slides and that was taken care of. Okay. Uh, Paul Gunter, do you have a question? 
Yes, I wanted to know if there's an update on ongoing health studies coming out of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I also prepared this uh, as a written uh, remark, but um, is there an ongoing, uh, is there an update on ongoing health studies coming out of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident? I am personally not aware. Do you know, Mary? It's a good question. Um, the most recent uh, study that I've done in terms of reading is of a man who was already studying monkey populations. And monkeys are, of course, closest to humans in many biological factors of the wild animals that live in Fukushima Prefecture. And this man was already studying um, these populations before the accident. And he's continued his studies. And it was reported by Forbes magazine. And um, he has about six different parameters where he is showing that the physiology of the monkeys is being very stressed um, since 2011. Um, you know, we're way ahead of being able to report cancers from these accidents. Um, and with the displacement of population, which is, you know, Chernobyl is a diaspora, really, and Three Mile Island also, people left. They went in many, many different directions. It's next to impossible to actually do what the survivors of the A-bombs, they were tracked for their whole lives, um, many of them, and some of them are still being tracked 70 years later. Um, tracking after a, a, to do large epidemiological studies after a reactor accident has never been established. So there's dribs and drabs. People are suffering. People are sick. Mothers are taking their children away because they're concerned and yet the officials in the area are saying it's all psychological. But the monkeys don't suffer from that. So the fact that there are appreciable impacts to the monkeys is one of the stronger data sets available. Um, Mitchell Lee, do you have a question? If we don't seem to have Mitchell Lee on the line, maybe um, if there's another one in the queue. Um, Ann Frisch, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I'm wondering what is the most effective strategy for eliminating nuclear weapons? And what is the most persuasive argument uh, in dealing with the general public? Uh, do you mind if I ask a clarifying question? Um, uh, for the general public side of that, do you mean around nuclear power or around nuclear weapons or both? Well, I would say around nuclear weapons, but I'm I'm also. Oh, did we lose you? Did you meet yourself? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm interested in both nuclear power and nuclear weapons because of the connection between them. I would be interested if you have answer for either one of both on, in terms of persuading the general public? Yeah, so I mean, I'll say that uh, one of the most exciting developments in nuclear weapons abolition that I've seen in recent times is the, the work that PSR and IPPNW and uh, the International Campaign for the, to Abolish Nuclear Weapons have done around the, uh, the nuclear ban treaty at the United Nations. And so any amount of you know, public pressure uh, from the grassroots level to um, to to have the United uh, United States join that would um, is is really important. You know we need we need more elected officials, um, you know from the bottom up to be talking about you know pressuring the the U.S. federal government to um, to sign that nuclear ban treaty. Um, and uh, so that's that's what I would say on that. Um, I think I think for one thing it it has sort of fallen out of uh, the broader public attention, both nuclear power and nuclear weapons issues. Um, 
particularly people of my generation. I, I'm in my young tw- my, my early 20s, and uh, a lot of us didn't live through the duck and cover uh, era. And so um, I think one of the most important things that can be done is to connect uh, nuclear weapons with the other issues that are already instinctively understood by people of the millennial generation um, and see, for example, the connection between Pentagon spending, uh, which is an enormous part of our federal budget, um, and how that goes to fund nuclear weapons. Um, as an example, Georgia WAND, Women's Action for New Directions, has a whole campaign going right now uh, where people fill out these little signs that say, what would you spend it on? Um, referring to the amount of funding there is for nuclear weapons and Pentagon spending. Um, oh. And that that has been a really, you know, it seems like that's been very effective in helping to do some education for people uh, about nuclear weapons issues. In terms of nuclear power, I think one of the most effective things is for grassroots organizers um, to get together, you know, for, for activists on the ground level to talk to each other and talk to their utilities um, that are receiving electricity from nuclear power plants um, and get their utilities to understand the health impacts and social uh, impacts of nuclear power. In addition to its incredible in, and rising costs um, economically, um, and then put pressure on utilities to divest from nuclear power at that level. That's those are some of my uh, suggestions. Can I chime in briefly on that one? Please. Um, at, along with the federal subsidy to nuclear weapons, all that massive Pentagon budget, aging reactors are not competitive anymore. At one time, nuclear power was just sort of like a ATM for investors, but now there's so many parts that have to be replaced, so many upgrades to keep those old reactors online, that they are becoming more and more in need of um, reinvestment, if you will, and it's not the same in all parts of the country, but in some parts of the country, this is turning out to be state and federal proposals for major, major taxpayer or ratepayer bailout, where the energy customers in the East would be asked to pay over and above the electricity that they're getting, special fees to keep quote unquote baseload power that could be both coal and nuclear. This is a proposal that's cropped up in a number of states in the East. And there's also been federal proposals, um, both of which have been rejected. The first was the Obama EPA plan for um, carbon, the carbon rule. That was greatly changed by activism on the part of clean energy folk, uh, pointing out that nuclear and coal really did not, should not qualify for any subsidies at all, and the Obama administration agreed with them. And the same thing just happened this past um, fall winter at the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And you can learn more about those at the nirs.org and I'm sure other websites if you uh, want to learn more about those bailouts. But those are successes on the nuclear side, but we're not done. There are still states trying to give um, older reactors more money. I just read about one this morning, Minnesota is moving, trying to move that direction. So um, in both cases, it really is follow the money and I think there's a lot we can do and have done and, and need to just keep going for the clean, cheap renewables are ready. I have a follow-up question or comment if you have time. Sure. Uh, first of all, there is a movement to do microgrids, which are independent, uh, renewable energy powered um, communities. And I think that would be great to get out of uh, the uh, vulnerability from helping from other countries, if that is a serious threat, as we we're told. Um, and people are people are actually doing this. They are renewing heat, heat going into um, making more heat. Um, and so that that I think is a fantastic. On the negative side, Canada is uh, sending in a big. Uh, ill-fitted truck uh, to Savannah, Georgia, nuclear waste, and there are a lot of people who are concerned, but now it's a big secret for the next 100 trucks or something like 23,000 liters of nuclear waste that goes to Savannah, Georgia, and I'd be interested if you know anything about that. We are concerned about acting on that. 
Yeah, Mary, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the Savannah River um, Canada export thing. Um, uh, I what I will say. Off our topic today, Damon, maybe yeah. we should another maybe question. We should Maybe we should keep it then. Yeah. I'll, I'll, what I will say is that, you know, energy demand, um, any anything that can be done to sort of reduce utility scale energy demand is definitely a, a, an attractive piece of the renewable energy uh, puzzle and um, sort of more distributed energy resources like rooftop solar is a, is a good piece of the equation, in my opinion. But yeah, let's go to the next question. Um, Herbert Moyer, do you have a question? I do. Um, I was wondering if the uh, choice of the male specimen and the, the uh, idea of um, averaging out the uh, releases over a one-year period, are those features incorporated into the BEIR-6 study? Can you hear me? Um, yes, but I, uh, you're further into the weeds than I am on what the DER6 study is. What is that? Well, well I think he's talking about the effects of ionizing radiation. Uh, by maybe oh, I'm sorry, the I'm not Academy sure. Of Sciences. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, so, are, yeah, they, are they using that question, faulty data? It. And the, the answer is that these are actual, uh, this is an actual data set of people and actual cancers are counted um, over 60 years and reported. And in, they're actually tables in the BEER-7 Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation report that report these numbers. But they're um, so many in 100,000. And all I did was boil those numbers down to the simple ratios. And they are stark when they pop out. Uh, so it's not the same thing as taking a regulatory basis, which is where the adoption of reference man has been done and where the okay. annual uh, compliance period, you know, you, they, they actually let the um, licensees collect all their own data and subject it to whatever processing to show that they meet the standard that has been set. And the actual raw data is never released to the public, let alone real-time monitoring that would allow somebody to go, oh, there's a spike. Hmm, do I want to close my windows? Or other forms of protective action that an individual could take if they had access to the actual real-time information, which our current structures don't give any access to unless you buy your own monitoring equipment. We've approached two of the last three New Hampshire governors to try to get real-time independent offshore radiological monitoring to no result. So I think that's that's critical, but we're not having much success with the governors. And as I pointed out, every reactor vessel has to be opened to refuel. So this example is one reactor where we had a leak of information, but it's ap applicable to every reactor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Sorry, for your question. Yeah. We have another, Julia? Um, well, let's uh, move to the written questions. Um, Paul Roden asked, are they still using the spider wart plant to measure exposure in Japan? I don't know the answer to that. Do you, Mary? Um, spider wart is a naturally occurring plant that reacts to ionizing radiation by changing color. It's a very interesting and important phenomenon to know about. Um, I actually know much more about its use in the United Kingdom in the past than I do about Fukushima today. But, um, you know, I think we all would benefit by reaching out to organizations in Japan that have um, English capacity and asking these questions directly there. Um, I certainly have friends who are spending their lives now creating links for information to get out. And um, yet the nuclear 
Citizens Nuclear Information Center in Tokyo is where I would encourage people to begin because they have staff and capacity to actually um, share information with people about what's going on today in Fukushima. Um, there are smaller groups, uh, certainly Greenpeace is active there, Friends of the Earth is active there, um, but go getting directly with people who are there today I think is really important. I haven't been there since 2016. Mary, can you say the name one more time of that Tokyo group you talked about, the center? The Citizens Nuclear Information Center in Tokyo. Great, and so that folks can Google that. Right Okay, um, Anne Berman asked, what happened to the recently advertised but then canceled CDC presentation on the health reaction to a nuclear weapon use? Oh, I didn't even know about this. Um, does Barb or Mary, do you, have either of you heard of that? I, I missed part of the beginning. Could you read it again, Julia? Uh, what happened to the recently advertised but then canceled CDC presentation on the health reaction to a nuclear weapon use? I know nothing about it. No, and neither do I. So um, I would invite the, um, the questioner to send an email to, uh, to me, perhaps, at bgottlieb at psr.org with a little bit of information so we can look into it. Thank you. Okay, um, and John Burke asked, uh, as the 39th year since Three Mile Island nuke incident has just passed and no new nukes have been built in the U.S. except for at existing nuke sites, do you think the future of nuclear power is dead? Oh, this is a very good question. Um, so the future of nuclear power. Uh, I certainly think that the era of conventional nuclear power plants is in the rearview mirror for the United States due to um, cost and economics. Um, I think that uh, there's there's very uh, pretty much nobody who's really excited about investing in conventional nuclear reactor technology. The real danger, in my opinion, is uh, in companies that are proposing these so-called small modular nuclear reactors. Um, so the example being an Oregon-based company called New Scale, um, who is wanting to build a first of its kind small modular reactor fleet at the Idaho National uh, Laboratory site um, in Idaho Falls, um, and then sell the electricity to the Department of Energy and the Utah Associated Munici Municipal Power Systems um, and have it operated by the, the nuclear plant operators at the Columbia Generating Station in Eastern Washington. So this is a very like spread out project uh, proposal that, um, uh, they, the new scale is really trying to market this as as clean power and trying to pick up funding for it uh, wherever they can. Um, and so for me, that's the real danger is that there are groups like new scale and in, in Tennessee, there's another one as well um, that are trying to promote small modular reactor technology. It's it's untested and as I said before, unproven to beat any of the you know cost issues of conventional nuclear power plants. Um, but and yet there, you know, the Department of Energy, uh, Sec Energy Secretary Rick Perry is a big, big fan of this small modular reactor idea. And um, his whole his whole line is he wants to bring coal and nuclear plants, um, you know, on online and, and, and promote that as as the energy future. Um, and so we need to be doing everything that we can to tell our legislators um, that uh, that this is not something that should be supported as a clean energy solution um, that. Uh, the era of coal and nuclear is 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 a bygone era. That's that what's definitely need, what we need to be advocating for. Well, I think that's a wonderful note for us to end on, as we are just about at our hour. So I'd like to thank everyone. Thanks to Damon Mott's story and Mary Olson for your wonderful presentations. Thank you to Julia for your technical assistance, and thank you to everyone who who joined us on the uh, webinar today. Please do follow PSR's alerts and newsletters for announcements of upcoming webinars and events. This is Barbara Gottlieb reminding you that power should never be poisonous. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much.